y'all doing? It's good to see y'all again this week as we dive into the back into Romans. Still in Romans, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12 today. So as we're getting started, I want you to do three things for me. If you haven't already, pause the video, go get your Bible, get something to write with, and get something to write on. Whether that's your personal study guide that you have a link to that you can download, or whether that's a tablet or a notebook you journal in, uh, pause the video, go get your stuff. When you're ready, hey, and invite a friend on Facebook, share this with somebody, or grab someone in your family maybe to come sit down and watch this with you. I'm in a different location, I'm at my house today uh, doing this video, so hopefully you're at your home with your loved ones and you can have Bible study and join me in my house for it as well. All right, so pause it, come back, we'll, get, we'll dive right in. As we're getting started, just to let you know, Romans 12 is one of my favorite passages of Romans. Uh, Part of it is is because we kind of get down to the practical side of things. Paul does the high and lofty arguments all the way through the beginning, but all of a sudden Romans 12 hits. When we get to Romans 12, we get down to the nuts and bolts. Everything that Paul talked about, about our sin nature and the law and how we're supposed to live and, and that we needed Jesus and, and all those different theological, philosophical concepts that he brought. Now we get to the nuts and bolts. This is how a Christian is supposed to live. So as we dive into it, let me just get started here. And there's a word they like to use in here in this illustration on a regular basis that uh, I say a little different. So if you hear me say the word bowl, I mean boil, okay? What happens when water boils or bowls, if you use my vernacular, okay? And, and here's an example, okay? Here's a definition of what happens when water gets hot enough and those bubbles start coming up. Water, as it is heated, becomes turbulent and gives up its dissolved air into the form of bubbles. Then, intermolecular hydrogen bonds begin to break apart and mo molecules of water change from liquid to vapor form. The vapor coalesces into water vapor bubble, bubbles, which in turn the turbulent coalesce into, to form larger bubbles. These are prevented from escaping into the atmosphere until the force of the atmosphere caused by gravity is overcome and the bubbles cause the bubbles escaping. Uh, this adds to the turbulence of the water. We call this ever increased, increasing turbulence bringing water to a rolling bowl, boil. Okay, so when we think about this, here's the science behind adding heat to water and how it gets hot and these bubbles start coming up and it starts cooking our food, whether that's your macaroni and cheese, your pasta, you know, for your spaghetti noodles or, or, or cooking boiled eggs. But whenever you go to turn on your pot and boil some water, you go through that thought process of everything that goes on. Now, it's nice to know that's how it happens, but I don't know about you. I just don't think through terms like that. Some engineers and scientists may, and I understand that, but I don't, okay? So when I go and I turn, put water in a pot and I turn heat on to make macaroni and cheese with, I know if it's gonna cook, eventually it's gonna get hot enough these bubbles are gonna come up, and that's when I pour the macaroni in. So I understand that concept. That's the practical side. But when we understand some things along the way of, of just that turbulence that kicks in and all of a sudden the, the bubbles are small and they get bigger and bigger, it's good to know that every now and then in the back of your head and you just got that and say, hey, well, that's what we're talking about. It makes more sense in the application. But you take the things that are complex and you put them into the common actions. Here, Romans 5, all the way from the beginning of Romans and Romans 5 and 8, we used a, the, when Paul shifted, he used the term therefore. Here in 12, we go to another, therefore, which means it's a transition in the message that Paul has given to the church at Rome. And, uh, you know, in Romans 8, he sits there and says, therefore, there is no condemnation in Christ. Great verse, great, awesome verse in Romans, but it's a big shift. And from what he was talking about, about sinfulness and the law prior to that now we have no condemnation in Christ. And now in this section, in chapter 12, all the way through the rest of this, the text of Romans, he's going to shift to the, the practical side of things. So, so when we look, as we said before, when you see a therefore, you need to understand what the therefore is there for. So when we read, and I'm going to read the first two verses for us, then we're going to pause and I want you to go back and read them for yourself, okay? But to get a little context, let's look at Romans chapter 11, starting at verse 33, just to kind of understand what the therefore is there for. Uh, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. 
For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And in verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. So when you see for from him and through him and to him are all things, therefore, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we have these, these two verses here, and when we start, we talk about for from him, through him, and to him are all things. Therefore, present yourself as a living sacrifice. Everything that Jesus has done, everything of who he is, now it's your turn. How does this apply to your life? You present yourself as a living sacrifice. So what is a living sacrifice? What's the term living sacrifice? And I want you to pause, and I want you to read through verses 1 and 2 again. And there's some words that help describe what a living sacrifice is. And I want you to, one, figure out what those words are. But two, turn and write a definition for living sacrifice. Use those words in that definition as well. When you're done with it, when you and the Holy Spirit, when you and the people you're with are done having a conversation about that, writing down your notes, come back and rejoin us on this video. Paul uses this great word, living sacrifice. And when we talk about a living sacrifice, there are three words that he used to describe it. One, the sacrifice, he uses the word living. Living is not normally something you use with, with a sacrifice. You know, if you look in the Old Testament, you had to have something that was um, a perfect lamb, right? No blemishes, uh, no defects in it. And it was presented to God. And it was presented to God. It was presented living. But the problem with sacrifices are in the Old Testament, they died. So to present yourself a living sacrifice, Paul comes to this conclusion of because of everything that God's has done in your life you need to sacrifice yourself every day you're a living sacrifice you put yourself on that altar and you say god here i am because of the blood of christ i'm unblemished and i'm set apart what do you want me to do the problem with living sacrifices are is that they're still living and a lot of times living sacrifices like to try to get off the altar and a lot of times we like to get off that altar and live our own way versus just being on the altar as an animal would, right? The animal didn't have a choice. We do. So it's easy for us to put ourselves on that altar and it's just as easy for us to get off that altar ourselves. But Paul says, present yourself as a living sacrifice. So we should always be putting ourselves on that altar saying, God, what do you want us to do? Now, what kind of sacrifice is it? Two words help describe that as well. Holy, which means separated from the world and consecrated to God. Such a sacrifice is pleasing to God. Because of who Christ is in your life, you're considered holy. You're consecrated before God. You're set apart. So don't live like the world. Be set apart. Be holy. So the living sacrifice, it's holy. And what? It's not just holy, but it's pleasing to God. And when it's pleasing to God, this is the same term, the terminology that, that Paul used when the church of Philippi sent their offering. And Epaphroditus brought it to him. And he said, your gift that you gave was pleasing, a pleasing sacrifice to God, a pleasing to God. And so in this concept, we talk about being a living sacrifice. It's a living sacrifice that is holy and set apart and that is acceptable to God. It's not something he's going to reject. Why? Because Christ is in us. Therefore, we can be that sacrifice as we say, this is how I'm going to be more like Christ each and every day as we go forward. Down in verse 2, one of the words that just kind of jumps out to me is we talk about just uh, how do you discern the will of God? And that's one of the big questions I hear on a regular basis. I just don't know what God wants for my life. And I think a lot of times we try to think, what's the will of God? For What's the big purpose in my life? You know, what is God calling me to? And I think too many times we think that it's way up here. But in this context, in this context, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And I think discerning the will of God here, as we talk about that living sacrifice we make every day, is that we're trying to figure out what God's will is each and every day in our life. 
And it may not be this big picture, and God may reveal that to you, but it may just be, hey, this is what God wants you to do today. And as we're going through life, that the Holy Spirit is nudging us in the directions. He may be given some detours along the way, and we don't need to blow past those detours. I think of Paul in, in Acts when we talk about his Macedonian call. It says that Paul went this direction, but the Spirit prevented him from going. And he was going to go this direction, but the Spirit prevented him. He was going to go this direction, but the Spirit prevented him. And he said, God, I'm kind of what, where do you want me to go? And then God sent him the Macedonian call. Picture of a Macedonian saying, come over here to us. And then the next morning he gets up, him, and they leave. But what we see is that Paul was going and the Holy Spirit was nudging. Paul was going and the Holy Spirit was nudging. A lot of times we'd like to just sit and say, God, I'm waiting. And God's like, I'm waiting for you to move. As we're moving, as we're going, we're sacrificing our desires for his every day. We're those living sacrifices and that God is, we're discerning God's will because he's nudging us as we walk, as we go. He is nudging us along the way. And the Holy Spirit saying, no, you don't do that. This is where I want you to go. And he's nudging us. Maybe he says, stop, hang a right. This is the detour. That's not the best path for you. So we need to be discerning the God's, God's will as we move forward in and throughout uh, our day. Um, but as we keep talking about these verses, I know we talked about a living sacrifice, but what's the difference between uh, being conformed and being transformed? And if you need to pause and think about that for a moment, you can. But what's the difference about, between being conformed and transformed? In uh, this verse, it says, do not be conformed to the world. Too often times it is so easy for us to be conformed and pressed into the mold that the world wants us to be, right? Broad is the path that leads to destruction. It is the easy path, right? It's easy for us to find that mold, fit into this world, and do the things that the world wants to do. But God says be transformed. Paul writes here from the Holy Spirit, he says be transformed by the renewal of your mind so you can discern the will of God. Why when we discern the will of God? It's what's acceptable and perfect, set and arrogate that leads to righteousness, that leads to eternal life. So the difference between being conformed is a lot, it's easy for us to be conformed and pressed instead of us being completely changed. I look at it this way, since we've already had our science lesson about water bubbling and, and getting hot, um, I look at it this way too. There's a difference between a physical change in nature and a chemical change in nature. If I were to take a cake and I put all the ingredients into a cake and I mix it up, that's a physical change. I put it in there, I stirred it up, but I could, if I wanted to, take the water out. I could take pieces and parts of it out. But once I take that cake, no molecular thing has taken place, has changed. But once I take that cake batter and I put it in a pan, I put it in the oven and I add heat to it, a chemical reaction takes place. It's no longer cake batter anymore. It's cake. It's different. And some of us love cake batter, and some of us love cake. But you can't separate molecularly. You can't separate those items back out once the cake's been put under heat like that. There's a chemical change that's taking place. So when we talk about being conformed, we can we can conform things and we can manipulate things and, and m move things. But once we talk about being transformed, that's a chemical change. There are things that don't come, that doesn't come back from that. You're different now. So when you talk about transforming your mind, we're talking about you're going in a direction that you can't go back from. You're going toward God and you're not going to go back. Be transformed each and every day as we move forward. So how does salvation change the way a person thinks? What impacts does salvation have on a person's values? I remember my dad had a neighbor that uh, was a good guy, but was not a believer. And then all of a sudden, Christ came into his life. And when Christ came into his life and changed him the very next week, he went and did his old things that he used to do. He hung out with his friends, and he, he went to certain restaurants or bars and stuff like that, and he started looking around and realizing, wait a minute, I don't need to be here because I'm thinking different than they think. Why? Because he has been transformed in the renewing of his mind and who Christ is in his life. There was a change that came in and took place. And he saw that within the first week of his life that he was different than who he used to hang out with. 
because Christ is coming and changed him. It changes our values. So how have you seen it change the way you think? How have you seen it change your values? Maybe that's something you just need to pause, write down and jot down or discuss with someone uh, this week as, it come, as, you, as you talk about it. But salvation changed how we relate to other believers here, right? Salvation changes how we relate to other believers. So in our next section, we're going to look through, we're going to skip down and look through 9 verse 13. And if you read uh, 3 through 8, what you're looking at is, is talking about the different parts of the body of the believers. There are different people with different gifts and the spirit and your faith increase those gifts differently. So how is it that even though we are different in so many ways, how is it that God wants us to treat other believers as well? So as we look through verses 9 through 13, look for key words and underline those key words. Jot down those key words that each of these directives that Paul gives to his leaders, to his readers. Uh, how is it that we're supposed to treat other believers? So go ahead and pause now, verse 9 through 13, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up from there. So after dealing with the use of gifts within the church, Paul turns his attention to the topic of love, right? Jesus ranked love of God and love of neighbors as the most important commandment for us to know in Mark chapter 12, verse 30 through 31. The love that the believer had for one another uh, was a sign by which the world would know that they were Jesus' disciples. And that's in John 13, 34 through 35. Paul assumed also that Christians would love since God has been, God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit in Romans 5, 5 in this book. But the believers in Rome were urged to make sure that this love was without hypocrisy. And love must be more than a pretense or an outward action that does not reflect the nature of God. Okay, so we need to make sure that we're loving. We're not being hypocrites about it. So as we look through and identify these directives, uh, which ones do you struggle with? Which ones are hard for you to look at or to be a part of? Uh, what are some ways that you can improve on how you love and treat other believers? In verse 9, right? Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. That's a harsh word, right? It didn't say frown upon it. It says abhor it. That's whew. love. Let love be genuine without hypocrisy. And let people around you know that you hate evil things, right? Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. How do we love one another with brotherly affection? And then it says, outdo one another in showing honor. How many times do we want to receive the honor instead of give the honor? Outdo one another. And I'm not talking about that fake of, oh, no, you please go first. Oh, no, you please go first. Oh, no, I don't. Man, that rubs me the wrong way when it's not genuine. But when you see genuine people, they're like, oh, no, no, by all means. You know what? That's your chair. You sit there. No, no, we want you to be there. We're so glad you're here. And when you see the genuineness of it, Man, it changes people. And you sit there and you're like, I want to hang out with that person more. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Don't be lazy when it comes to being passionate about the things of God. But it says, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Ooh, be patient. Ooh, how many times have you thought, God, why don't you have to put that one in there? Right? Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer and contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So as we look down and all these that you just jump around and, and see them, which ones stick out to you? Which ones do you struggle with? Which ones are easy for you? Which ones do you see in other people's lives? And maybe you should write these out and then start writing people's name out by it and say, you know what? I see this in that person's life. I see this in that person's life. I see this in my life. I am horrible at this in my life. And I struggle with this in my life. And maybe that's something you need to hand over to God and say, God, I need you to help me with this as we go down, as we move. Uh, but as, as we're talking about these directives that, that Paul gives us, hospitality was the process by which a stranger became a guest, right? Hospitality in the old days, they didn't have inns all over the place. They didn't have these places, these big hotels when you travel, you went to. A lot of times in this culture, what you could do is go up to someone's house and they would have a spare room for guests that would come by, whether it was relatives or not. And if it was available, then you would take them, you would feed them, and welcome them in. 
And then you could develop these patterns of, especially these salespeople that would be traveling from city to city, that they could stop in at these places. And it goes from you being a stranger to all of a sudden you being a guest to being a friend, someone that you know, you share dinner with. And hospitality was something that, that the church really believed in. It was especially important to Paul's time because of the lack of safe, uh, inexpensive places for them to stay. But also, how did missionaries go from church to church? They had to go from house to house to house. When Jesus sent out the disciples, what did he say? He said, go, and they invite you in. They're inviting me in, so be a part of it. They reject you and say, I have no place for you to stay because of who you're associated with. They're rejecting me, not you. So see, they, the culture allowed for people to do this, and they were very hospitable. And some places were known for not being hospitable. But he says, as Christians, and we're supposed to love, we're supposed to be hospitable to people. We're supposed to be inviting. And people are supposed to want to come and hear and learn from us. So salvation changed how we relate to other believers. Salvation changes how we relate to other people, believers. But also, salvation changes how we relate to all people. Right? So, so those verses talk about how we relate to other people. The next section talks about how we re- relate to all people. So if you look at verses 14 through 18, look at the, and underline these words, write down these words for you, uh, that we talk about how do we label these, right? Maybe make a column, other people, all people, and just kind of jot them down as you go. But how are we supposed to live and affect all people around us? So pause and read those verses for us. Jot those down and come back when you're done. So Paul turns his attention from proper perspective on life within the body to the proper way we relate to outsiders as well. He admonishes believers to bless those who persecute you. I don't know about you, but that's a hard one. Bless those who are trying to harm you, persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Why do we say bless and do not curse? What did Jesus say? He said, I tell you to love your enemy, right? Because even the Gentiles love one another. They love their own people. But Jesus says, I do things different. Love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. Here, Paul emphasizes that again. and says, bless and do not curse those. But, but bless those who persecute you. Bless someone that calls down. Uh, uh, to bless someone is to call down God's gracious action in that person's life. Have you ever thought? Someone that you know that doesn't like you. You don't like them. Have you prayed for them? And I'm not talking about God taking care of them. I'm talking about God changing them and also changing you. And say, hey God, this person is my enemy. What can we do to help show the love of God to them? Because see, the world would pray the opposite. God, take care of these people for me. Versus saying, God, I'm going to pray for them and hopefully we can come back. I think a lot of times if we would sit here and say, go out. I think we did this with our... uh, our chocolate. I said, just as the Bible said, take your chocolate, go out and invite your enemy to church. Can you imagine that? What would happen? You go up to someone at your work, someone in your neighborhood, someone in your family that y'all just had a falling out. Y'all just don't see eye to eye on things. And you say, you know what? I love you so much. I'm praying for you. I would love for you to come and be a part of church service with us. I'd love for you to check us out on Facebook. Since we're not physically meeting at church, just check us out on Facebook. Because why? Because Because I know God's in my life, and I know he needs to be in your life too, and I'm going to pray for you. And yeah, they may persecute you, and yeah, but man, it's going to throw them off, isn't it? It's going to throw them off a little bit. But pray for them. Why? Because that's what the Bible says we do. That's how we treat all people. Because you know what? We used to be them too. We used to be enemies of Christ. They're enemies of Christ because they don't know who Christ is. It's our job to share that with someone. I was ministering to someone this week. I had to go change a light bulb and uh, at someone's house. And when I get over there, someone warned me. They said, man, they're just angry with God. They're angry at everybody and everything. Sure enough, they were right. And I was so, I was like, oh, I've really got to get out of this place. Didn't like God. Hated God. God never shed blessing on them. God allowed other people to have good things while cursing them. And their mindset was, I'm just going to curse everyone around me. Don't want to have anything to do with God. But thanks for coming over and helping. And I keep challenged back. And, he's, and they keep talking about, I just give and I give and I get nothing in return. I said, well, you know what the Bible says. It talks about giving. It never really talks about receiving. 
it talks about us giving of ourselves, but never really receiving anything back. I said, so you need to kind of change your perspective on some of those things. And I mean, just got angry. But I prayed for it. I said, God, there has got to be a softening of the heart if this person is going to change. There's got to be a softening of the heart of this person. And I really don't want to go back and change the light bulb. But I also know the bulb breaks. I'm probably going to go back and change another light bulb. Because that is the way that we're supposed to do it and act differently. Is that going to change that person's life? I have no idea. But I know that's what I'm called to do. And it may not change her, but it may change some of the people in the neighborhood around her. It may change some people in the neighborhood around them. Okay? So I'm called to do that. So Paul says, even here in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Associate, when it talks about associating, it means to accommodate to a situation or circumstance. You know, we want to don't associate with people in those circumstances, but is our responsibility uh, for those who have financial means to adjust to the person in the lowly position. And I, I like what the, the commentary said on this. Paul's antidote for pride was to associate with the needy, the outcast and the less fortunate. You talk about a way to stay humble, is that when God blesses you, go hang out with those that it seems like God hadn't blessed. Go hang out with those that are still needy. Go hang out with those that are outcasts. Go hang out with those that are less fortunate. And that's going to keep you in the right, proper perspective, right? One, it's probably going to make you more giving, but it's going to make you appreciative of what you do have. And so how is it we can sit back and not be prideful? We're going to hang out with those that don't have pride according to the world standards. We're going to hang out with the lowly, the outcast, and the, the less fortunate. And this attitude keeps us thinking in the right path. So Paul says, hey, if God's blessed you with all this, go hang out with those that God's blessed in other ways. And that'll help you from being arrogant. And that'll help you stay humble as well. So what actions can we do well? And which ones do we struggle and follow when we're talking about ministering to all people? Which one of these is we look down from verse 14 through 18? What are the things that we struggle with? And what are the things that we succeed with? Maybe in the same list you write out people that you know. They say, hey, I see this in this person's life. I see this in this person's life, right? This is what I need to work on. How can you improve in relating to all people, especially for those who seek to harm you? And, and as we continue on, just a couple more of the questions. What can believers do to foster peace with one another? What can we do to foster peace? And I think that's one element of the American church that we need to focus on more, is how can we be peaceable in our church? Does it mean give away your opinions, give up on your opinions or how you think things are done. But there's a peaceful way to handle that. There's a peaceful way to not criticize, but to critique, to encourage, to nudge versus just getting mad because it's not going your way. The songs aren't sung the way you want them. Uh, the way the direction of the church isn't the way you think it should be going. Uh, all these things along the way, how things are gonna go. I've been in a conference call uh, this week, we're talking about reopening the church, and we've been talking to Louisiana Baptist Convention, and the one thing that they kept saying over and over is, show a lot of grace to your pastors, because we had no clue. We're going to do something one week, and we're going to say, hey, that didn't work, and we're going to try again next week. But guess what? We're going to show a lot of, he also said, show a lot of grace to your congregation. So in these times when we're coming back and thinking of coming back, and some people think we should be, we should have been back. We should have never shut down. And some people think we should stay shut down for another month or two. Whatever those people are, remember, they're in the family of God. And we're going to live peaceable in these times, in these situations. So how can we show, foster peace with one another? One is, think of it from their perspective, right? If God's blessed you with this, hang out with these people. If God's blessed you with this, hang out with these people so that you can see the peace and that harmony that God wants us to have. And the phrase that he puts in here, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That means by all means, by all means, live peaceably by doing your part. Don't wait for them to do theirs. Do your part. And if you come at it and say, you know what, I'm going to be peaceful when it comes to the church. I'm going to be peaceful when it comes to other believers. I'm going to be peaceful when it comes to all people around us. Then when you're doing your part, 
then you'll see God working in other people's lives. And you won't have that attitude of, I need something back. It'll be, a, I'm just going to be peaceful. As far as it depends on me, I'm going to be peaceful. I'm going to be peaceful as we move forward. So what would becoming a living sacrifice look like in your life? What would you need to give up? And what would you need to add? All right, that's our closing questions for today. I know in these last few minutes, there's a lot of questions. And I want you to go back, Paul's kind of jot down answers on all these so let me just list off those questions again just so we can be clear, okay? What actions do you need to do well of how to love all people, right? But uh, what can you improve on? Maybe there's some people you know. But what can believers do to foster peace with others? And how does the phrase, as far it depends on you, change the limits believers should go to foster peace? And then what would becoming a living sacrifice look like in your life? What do you add? And what do you need to take away? All right. So as we as we talk about that, and as y'all are thinking through and processing that, let me just close us in prayer and uh, look forward to this time. And uh, if you're new joining with us, you can either comment, email me. Love to talk to you about anything that you may have questions about as well. Okay. Father God, I do thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to come to hear your word. Thank you for this chapter, Father. Let us be living sacrifices. Let us be holy. Let us be acceptable. Let us be pleasing in your sight as we love genuinely, as we're hospitable to people. Father, as, as we pray for our enemies and those that are trying to harm us, as we pray for them, as we love on them, as we are being transformed each and every day in our life. Father, keep us looking forward to you and being more like you and less like this world and like ourselves. But Father, I pray and ask that you transform us each and every day. Let us love and let us be at peace in all things. In your name we pray and ask it. Amen. Thank you, and hopefully we'll see you soon.